Good morning, church. I want to encourage, all right. I want to encourage uh, everybody to grab a seat. We're going to start our worship service this morning. It is a pleasure to be able to worship together, isn't it? This only happens once every seven days, and it, it's, such, so it's special. It's a special time that we get together with the body of Christ, and it's over so quickly, isn't it? And so uh, we want to make sure that while we're here, we're focused on the, the, the things of the Lord and uh, the teachings of Christ and worshiping Him. And so uh, we're just glad to be able to hear, be here to do that. If you're a new visitor here this morning, we're really glad you're here. And uh, we want to encourage you to um, go back to the back um, foyer in the welcome booth. And we have a gift for you. And you can go talk to them about the different things we have going on in church. Well, we have, uh, for members, we have our quarterly business meeting right after this service. So please stick around. And um, we are, have a number of things to go over and decide on and some new members to talk about. So that's a wonderful thing. We also have, after Sunday school, we have the scholarship lunch for junior camp. It's at 1230. Oh, it's this Sunday, right? It's today. My notes say next Sunday, April 21st which is today, okay. Um, funds raised will help the junior campers earn money for camp. There is no charge, but donations are accepted. So um, you know what? If you have no plans for lunch, this is the thing to do and help some kids get to camp. This is a wonderful time of fellowship. And think of it as a time to fellowship with the other believers here at church. Now, starting in May, uh, the Children's Ministry presents The Great Jungle Journey. Answers in Genesis Vacation Bible School. It's every Wednesday in May from 6.20 to 8 p.m. Parents and grandparents register at the kid men table downstairs. Help your children to climb aboard for an epic cruise from Genesis to Revelation. See the insert in your bulletin for more information. There, are, there, are, there is no charge, but helpers are needed. And so please contact Megan Conant for details. Well, we are going to have a family movie night here at CFBC. Uh, our first movie will be uh, Overcomer on Saturday evening, next Saturday, April 27th at 6 p.m. The youth group will be selling concessions to raise funds for camp. There are flyers at the information booth that you can use to invite your friends and neighbors. I mean, really think about this. You can go to and watch a movie you don't have to be ashamed of, and it costs you nothing. This is a perfect situation. So I invite you to come out, bring your family to a movie next Saturday. Um, ladies, the women's retreat is May 17th through 19th. Sign up at the table in the lobby today. Also, there are several baby showers and gift baskets that will be happening in May. Details are in the bulletin. I want to encourage you to read your bulletin for any other things we have going on here at the church. Now, um, before we, we pray and we um, spend our time greeting one another, I want to mention the last of the four W's that we've been going through. Our church believes uh, that we should be living according to four W's, which are the calling of Christ. One is that we would be worshipers, that we would worship our Lord Jesus Christ in grace and truth. Two is that we would walk with others in fellowship, that we would somehow join a group of people, uh, primarily through Sunday school and growth group, that we are connected with, that we are um, responsible to, and that we can pray for. And then we want to, the third W, work. We want to work in the church and, and use the gifts God has given us, that, that he intended us uh, not to do nothing for him, but to do his work. And he gave us specific gifts in order to do that. And so we as pastors and elders, we'd be happy to help you figure out what that would be in the church. But the last thing is witness. We are called as a church, and we believe at this church that we are called to be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, that very call to be witnesses of the gospel is called the Great Commission. And the reason it's called the Great Commission is because though there are many purposes to life, like raising a family, like working, uh, like having friends and, 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 and doing things with them, that there is a great commission, a great purpose of life above those things that we are to be about. The, the, the actual reason that Jesus left us here on this earth when we were saved and didn't just rapture us away immediately like he did uh, with a couple of other men in history. And let me read to you what Jesus said about the Great Commission at the end of Matthew 28. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. 
And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We believe that we should be out there witnessing our faith so that the lost may know the truth of the gospel, that the Holy Spirit may work in their lives, and that they may be reborn in Christ. Amen? Amen. And so we want to reaffirm that as a church, that this is our goal. And we also believe that we do this best as a body of Christ. If you've at all been in the military, you know that one soldier can only do so much, but a squadron or a platoon of soldiers can do way more. And so it's the same thing with witnessing the gospel of Christ, that when we unite together to go out into the world and even to exemplify Christ as the body of Christ, then we are fulfilling life's purpose, which is to witness for the Lord. Well, as we think about that, will you stand with me as we declare God's word together? As we declare God's truth, let's, let's say this with our hearts, believing in its truth. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Romans 7, 4. Now would you take a moment and greet people around you. All right, let's head back to our seats and we'll start our time of worship this morning with some prayer. Father, thank you so much for the, the gift of family and community and um, the word of God. Lord, thank you for the time of preparation um, that the pastor, the teachers, the Sunday school teachers, the children's church has put in this morning. 
Lord, to bring you glory through the, the special revelation of your word. Lord, thank you for the, the wonderful gift of your salvation through your son, Jesus Christ, and through him alone. Lord, thank you for the, um, the encouragement as we sing this morning that you come alongside us, that you lead, you guide. Whom shall we fear, Father? And who is man that you are mindful of him? Lord, thank you for coming down and uh, joining us in relationship. Thank you for this morning together in your name. Amen. Amen. Worship the King.
Father, we worship you this morning. We worship you as king, as defender, as friend, comforter. Lord, your name is a strong and mighty tower. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Your name is strong and bright and tower. Your name is a shelter. prepare to hear the word spoken. Lord, I pray that uh, it wouldn't just be yet another day, Lord, but that we would stop and open the hearts that have been filled with the Holy Spirit, or if there are those here that are seeking, Lord, that um, we would recognize that you are the God of the universe, but you're also the God that came and saved us. Lord, I pray that we would be prepared for your word this morning in your name. Amen. Amen. When I talk to people about baptism, they often tell me how nervous they are to get up and um, share their testimony with the church. And um, I often get that as well with preaching. People say, do you ever get nervous? And I say, every time. Uh, but uh, well, I'll tell you what I always tell those who want to get baptized, and that is that um, you always have to remember that when you're speaking anything that's from the Lord up here in front of people, that you're speaking to family. And if you always remember that, then I, I think that's key, is that uh, we're a family. We're, we're the church of Christ, and we love each other, and we care about each other, and we care about his word, and we're going to delve into it this morning. Let me just pray for um, the word of God to come into our hearts. Heavenly Father, may you open us to your word, may our eyes be open to see what you want us to see. May our ears be open to what you want us to hear. May our minds be able to understand it and our souls be able to be nourished upon it. May your word um, feed our souls for the week to come. And I pray this in your name. Amen. 
Well, I'm not going to start off with reading our text today. It's a large text. We're in Romans 7, so I'd encourage you to get there. I'm going to read through it as I preach today. And it refers to sanctification. And we're continuing this study of sanctification. And it gets to an area that we all are very familiar with, which is the struggle with sin in our hearts. And many times this struggle is portrayed by an illustration. And the illustration is called uh, The Tale of Two Wolves. And it's a Native American story, and it goes like this. One evening, a Cherokee elder was teaching his grandson about life, saying, a fight is going on inside of me, to the boy. It is a terrible fight, and it is between two wolves, this battle that goes on between the two wolves and is inside us all. One wolf is evil. He is anger, jealousy, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. And the grandson thought about for a minute and asked his grandfather, Grandfather, which wolf will win? Wisely, the grandfather simply smiled and replied, the one you feed. Now, certainly there is a war going on inside of all of us, uh, whether or not to follow God or to follow our sin nature. But there is a fundamental truth that this story actually gets wrong. And um, it, it also should lead us to really question every worldly illustration about spiritual truths, because usually they'll get a lot of it right, but not all of it. And so certainly there is this battle going on inside of us. But the end of this story is that the one that wins is the one you feed. And the truth about um, the Christian life is that um, actually there's one that has already won, and that is um, the new nature of Christ. And we have that now. So that's what this story doesn't get right, is it makes it seem like, well, it could go either way. You never know who's going to win, whichever one you feed more. And the truth is, is that uh, the, one, the one has already won. But um, yet, there is still a battle going on inside of us because there's still a sin nature. So while we have victory in Christ, we still have a sin nature trying to get us to follow its ways. And so that is what we call the process of sanctification, is where you're battling against the sin in your life through the victory that you have in Christ, the new nature that you have, getting progressively and progressively more like Jesus, more holy, more set apart to be like God, and not looking like the world any longer. Now, beginning in chapter 6, Paul changed from the earlier parts of Romans to talk about sanctification. He had been talking about justification. That means be, to be declared righteous before God through faith alone in Christ alone. And when that happens, when you do that, you are born again. And when you are born again, you are justified in Christ. But after you are justified, God doesn't just finish with you there. He wants you to keep on living for him, and he's changing you. He's making you into something else practically so that your life actually looks different. And so in chapter 6, he tells us that um, we have been dead to sin positionally, and therefore we should sin less practically. So now that we have been dead to sin, we, we have been dead to it, and now we are resurrected in Christ, and spiritually resurrected, we should now live a new life. Then he goes on to say in chapter 6 that we are therefore slaves of God, and we obey him. So we should look like the master whom we obey, that people can actually tell that we are his servants. It's like asking the question, if you were put on trial for being saved, would there be enough evidence to convict you? right? That, that if you actually are justified in Christ, that the result of that should look like a different life, and that there should be enough evidence of your life to show that people that you're a Christian, that people can obviously say when asked, is this person a Christian? You can say, yes, based on their changed life, I see that they are. So then in chapter 7, we learn that we are dead to the law, uh, and that we have to follow Jesus in the new way of the Spirit to be like Christ. And so now when we're living in this sanctified life, it's not just rule following. Actually, as a matter of fact, that doesn't work. We have to actually walk by the Spirit. 
And that's where we pick up today. Because there's a problem. There's a problem with being sanctified, and that is this. We still have a sin nature at work in our members, in our bodies. So the desire to follow Christ and his ways is constantly in a struggle with sin, the desire to sin. And so here's the main point of where we're going today. As believers, we struggle continually between our true selves and our sin nature, and it is this struggle that leads us to holiness. So as we discuss how hard life is to live a life with the Spirit controlling us and the, and the sin nature tempting us and that battle going on, we need to understand this, that as much of a struggle as that battle is, it is to the glory of God as we are changed through this process. So we have three in, inner struggles. There are three inner struggles that Paul's going to talk about in Romans 7, verses 7 through 25. And the first struggle is this, my inner self struggles with the law. So my first struggle, this, this fight we have as Christians, is that we struggle with the law. Let's read verse 7. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means, for if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what, sin, what it is to covet if the law had not yet said, or not had, had not said, you shall not covet. So Paul starts out with a question, and he says, if, if we're supposed to be dead to the law, then is law, the law bad? Is the law itself sin? Is the law itself something that's evil? In other words, if I am dead to the law in order to be with Christ, is the law the problem? If, if Jesus had to save me from fulfilling the law, is the law the problem? And he immediately answers the question and says, by no means, no way. In, in, in no concept is the law sin. What the law does do is the law actually defines sin. It actually determines what it is. So Paul uses an illustration here from the Ten Commandments, and he uses one of the Ten Commandments which says, you shall not covet. And it's the last of the Ten Commandments. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, why did Paul choose, as an example of the law being a definition of sin and telling us what sin is, covetousness? And I think this is why. Because covetousness is very difficult to detect without the law. Some of the other ones, uh, you shall have no other gods before me, you can oftentimes see people worshiping false gods. You can detect that externally. Um, you shouldn't lie. People can, keep, people can detect a lie. You can tell if somebody's lying. Oftentimes you can catch them in it. But how do you catch someone in covetousness, right? Um, if you saw somebody looking at your new car that you bought, and they're standing there admiring your car, and you probably shouldn't walk up to them and go, I can tell what you're doing. You're a coveter. You want my car. They could just as easily be looking at it and say, you know, I was just fascinated by your bumper sticker, which says, in case rapture, this vehicle will be unmanned. I was, just, I, I was just thinking about how considerate you are to tell people that when you're gone and your car goes careening off into traffic, that you're not responsible for that because you're with Jesus now. It's very considerate of you. So they could be, you know, encouraging you. They could be thinking, yeah, you know, you're, you're, this is great for you. It's very difficult to detect coveting. So most likely, without the law telling us what coveting is, we probably wouldn't know what it is. And so when the law defines it, then we know what it is, right? Listen to what the literal definition of coveting is, and it's so perfect for this whole section on what sin does. Coveting is the desire for what is forbidden. See, now, now, see, right there in our minds, we just created a definition, didn't we? And we just identified. I'm looking at all your faces. We just identified, oh, that's what that is. Now, would we have known this without the law? Probably not. Would coveting have existed if we didn't know what coveting was? Yes, but we wouldn't know what it is. So then what's the problem with the law? Verse 8, but sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. So what's interesting is, is once we know what the law is, 
There's something inside of us called the sin nature which kicks up and says, now do that thing that the law tells you not to do. So it's not the law that's the problem, but once the law is introduced, the sin nature in us kicks in and wants to actually break that law. So in, in his example, Paul says, I, uh, at one, I once knew what it was, to, once I knew what it was to covet, my sin nature wanted to covet all the time. And I identified the coveting in my heart all the time because of the law. Now it says here that sin, it seized an opportunity through the commandment. The commandment, by the way, is just another way of saying the law. And it produced in me all kinds of covetousness. So what does it mean that the sin nature uses as an opportunity? Well, you see, here's, I think, one of the keys to this whole conversation about the law, is that in our sin nature, we misunderstand the law. And this is, hear me, brothers and sisters, this is fundamental to being a Christian. We misunderstand the law because our sin nature does not tell us that the law is for our good. Our sin nature tells us that the law is meant to restrict us. And that is, is when our sin nature kicks in and uses that as an opportunity to get us to want to break the law, right? Honestly, how many times have you gotten into your car and you don't want to put on your seatbelt because you don't want to be restricted? Right? That's, that's the kind of picture it is. And our sin nature goes, no, you don't have the right to restrict me even though there's a law about it. And so this is how our, our, our inner selves deals with sin, Think about it. Um, We see God's law wrongly as restrictive, which creates resentment, which then leads to rebellion. And that's the process of how the sin nature responds to the law. We misunderstand that the law, which God intended for our good, we say actually God is trying to keep us from something good. So we become resentful against God, and then we rebel against God. And is this not the description of the fall of Eve in the garden? God made a rule. It was for her good. You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But what did Eve see it as after she was deceived? She saw it as restrictive. And saying, God, it's not for my good that you made this law. It's for my bad. You're keeping me from good things. And then she resented God. And then she rebelled against him to get the good things. But it was a lie. And that plays out in our lives every single day. We believe that God's laws in our, in our selfishness or our sinfulness is restricting us. We want to break free of that. We don't want to be up, uh, underneath it because we don't think it's really good. We think it's actually really keeping us from the good, and so we rebel. And that's what it's talking about here. Then it goes on to say in verse 8, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. What does that mean? For apart from the law... It's dead. He's not saying that, that sin lies dead and then, and then somehow the law um, creates it. It's saying this, um, that sin, when it's undefined, technically does not exist. It's, it's dead. So sin has to be defined as sin in order for it to technically exist, even though the sin still does exist. In other words, we as human beings need uh, the revelation of God to understand the truth of what sin is. And until it's defined, we don't get it. Honestly, if you go out to talk to an unbeliever out there and you say, what does it mean to covet? Most people go, I don't know what you're talking about. They don't know. Do they covet? Yes. But they don't know what it is. So they don't feel like they're struggling with covetousness because they don't have a rule or a a standard to go by. It's kind of like this. I, I personally like to target shoot. And one of my favorite things to do is take my family and we go take our 22 rifles or pistols and we like to go shooting, okay? So we like to go out and go shooting. But here's my problem. Those little 22s are little tiny bullets, right? And so we'll go and you gotta put the target out a little distance. And so we put a target out there and the target is like this big and you put it out there and you sit there and you shoot this target and you're aiming for the bullseye but it's so far away you can't actually see what you're hitting. Some targets nowadays come with color changes so you can at least see where it is. But I use, I'm cheap, so I buy the paper ones. And so I have no idea what I'm hitting. And, and that's a problem, right? Because um, if you're shooting at something, 
but you can't see if you're hitting the target or what the target is, then it's useless. And I've had that experience many times where I'm shooting things, I don't know if I'm on target or not. So the only way to know if you're hitting your target is to be able to know what the target is and see it. The law is the target. Literally, the word sin means to miss the target. So when God puts the law out there, he's saying, this is your aim, this is the target, this is the bullseye, and when you miss it, you sin, you miss the target. So you have to have a target in order to miss it, right? So you have to have a law that has to be able to define what sin is. And that's when sin arises. Once we put that target out there and we hit outside the bullseye, all of a sudden our sin is nature saying, keep hitting outside the bullseye. And that you have hit outside the bullseye and that you're guilty. So the result of this sinful reaction, this inner rebellion against God's law, is to lead to death. Let me read verses 9 through 11 for you. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the result of our sinful reaction to the law, which is to then go, and get it, go ahead and fight against the law or to rebel against the law, is death. Now, these verses describe a childlike innocence before the law, uh, before the realization of the sinfulness of breaking the law. Before the law, people think that they are relatively good people. I mean, really, if we don't know what the rules of God are, we'll think we're pretty good people if we don't have a standard, if we don't have a bullseye. If you don't have a bullseye and you're shooting, then you're hitting your target every time, aren't you? Right? And so when you don't, when you don't have a standard, then you don't, you don't ever think you miss. And so that's what people live like in the world. They, they, they think, oh, I'm not a sinner. But then when you hold up the Ten Commandments, you said, have you ever lied? Oh, well, yeah. And have you ever had lustful thoughts? Mm, yeah, then that's called, Jesus calls that adultery. Have you ever done these things? And you start walking through, and when you start ticking off the, the Ten Commandments, you start realizing that we pretty much have broken them all. And, and if we've broken them all, that's an F in school, right? <laughs> so... So we're pretty innocent to these things, and we don't know whether we match up to God or not, but once God introduces his law, his own standard of holiness, which he has to do, brothers and sisters, God has to introduce the truth of the law. The law is necessary. Thus, we understand the law. We enter into a tug of war with our sin nature and thus experience death to sin. We experience death to sin because um, the law judges everyone so that God will use this as the pattern for judgment so that those who do not know Christ will be sent to eternal damnation for breaking his law, whether or not they know it. We talked about that earlier. But, but this is a passage primarily about sanctification. And so not only do, do people who are unbelievers die when they break the law, but we die a kind of sanctification death when we don't obey, when we don't follow the law. It, it, it's, it's, it's the fact that we're not growing in holiness because um, of our response to the law. Not following God's law as a Christian is keeping me from holiness, keeping you from holiness. So then he goes on in verse um, 10 and 11, and he talks about how the commandment promised life but brought death. And then in verse 11 it says, sin seized an opportunity and deceived me and through it killed me. And I want to explain real simply what this means. It means this. The law promised life, those who do these things shall live, and brought death because of sin, not because of it, but because sin then rebelled against it and, and caused death. But sin promised life and delivered death because of the law. So both promised life, um, and the law brought death because of sin, but so did sin, promised life and delivered death. And so here we have this, this problem with the law because as long as sin is involved, I will never be able to fulfill the law. It's only going to bring me condemnation, which leads us to verse 12. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. To be clear, we must say, though we are dead to the law, and though it cannot produce the righteousness that God wants us to have, the law is not bad. The law is holy. The law is good. The law is, 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 is actually a representation of the character of God. 
but it is sin in me that twists the law that brings ruinous things to my life. It's like living, the law is like living without a mirror and not knowing how dirty you are. You don't know if you don't have a mirror. But once a mirror is introduced, you then can see the reality of who you are and you can never forget it. And so as a Christian, you now know the truth about your own sin and it, and it brings frustration and this struggle. So we need to end this point in this. The law is good, but it cannot change me for the better because of my sin nature. Do we get that? That's the whole point of this. The law is good, but it cannot change me for the better because of my sin nature. And we talked about that last week. There's, been a, there's a saying that says this, the old nature knows no law, the new nature needs no law. The old nature, the sinful nature, does not recognize the law. It fights against it. And the new nature needs no law because now we have the Holy Spirit. So a believer who lives by the law will only, if we live by the law, will only activate sin, not eradicate sin. And that's not what we want. So following the law does not sanctify a believer because of the struggle that arises due to sin. And we have to know that. So we set aside the struggle with the law. We know it's there for the moment. Just set it on the side and say, look, following the law is not going to make me holier. It's just going to kick up the dust of my sin nature and make me dirty again. So then we move to then the inner self, point two, that struggles to fight my sin nature. So now let's talk about that sin nature. That's the real, that's the real fabric of who I am right now and, and what's working in me. Uh, let's look at that in verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Now this is a very difficult verse it's very hard to actually understand what this verse means. So first of all, it asks another question. So is that which is good, which is the law, is the law then not only not, is it, he's saying, okay, if it's not sin, is it the cause of my death? Is it the law that kills me? And again, he says, by no means. Just as it is not the law's fault that I sin, it's not the law's fault that I die. It's sin that produced death through what is good. Now think about that for a moment. Sin produces what death through what is good. That's a powerful truth. In other words, he's saying the law was never intended to be given by God so that it would kill you, so that it would ultimately be your judge. That's not the purpose he gave the law. And so when the law is used to kill you, to judge you, it's an unwilling tool. The use of the law by sin as a tool for death shows how evil sin is. Um, it's, it's one thing to use evil to make more evil. It's, it's very evil to use the goodness of the law to bring about death and sin. To deceive and to use something good like that is the ultimate evil. Um, after, after my family and I moved here, we had this house, and uh, after the first winter, we went through a storm. And I remember um, one night I'm sleeping and um, I hear this, as the rain is falling outside, I hear this in my bedroom, drip, drip, drip. And usually by the time you hear the dripping, it's because the pool has gotten so big in your, on your floor that it's actually a pool that it's actually bouncing off now, right? And I know that sound because it's not the only drippy house I've ever lived in. And I go, oh no, I got a leak. So I called a friend of mine, a uh, roofer, who uh, came over and take a look at my roof. And I have two valleys that are over my bedroom. And he said, you can't believe what I found. And uh, he opens it up. He says, there's holes in these valleys, these, these things that are supposed to keep the water. There's hole. There's a hole in this one and a hole in this one. And the guys who built your house actually uh, uh, accidentally punched holes through it. And, and you know what happens when there's holes in your roof? You know, like water goes through it. And uh, I thought, that's just horrible, you know, that these guys, they're putting, they're putting this valley in there for the purpose of keeping the water out, and they had a, allowed or made a big hole in it. Now, I'm assuming it was by accident, but can you imagine if somebody did that on purpose? They actually took something good, this house that's supposed to be a roof over your head, and they go, I'm going to mess with these people who live here. Boom! And they punch a hole right through it so that you experience leakage in your house. That's what sin does. 
Sin takes something good, something good that's being built out of you, and just to mess you up, punches a hole right through the roof and takes what's good and makes it bad. Takes what should be solid and makes it unstable. Takes what should be protecting you and makes it leaky. Does that make sense? So it's very evil to take something really good and use it to kill people. Use it to, to uh, uh, attack and, and use it for sin. And so this shows how evil sin is. Sin is so evil that it uses something good like God's character through his law to actually end your life. Because sin knows that it can use the law to get us to rebel. And here's the difficult thing. It's the sin inside of us. It's this factor working in us to try to get us away from God and to get us to not follow him. So verses 14 through 20 describe how this inner struggle continues to be perpetually in the life of a believer. So let's read 14 through 20. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He just described our everyday life, didn't he? Lord, I want to do what's right. I want to follow your law, but I fail all the time. And why is that? And why is it that I want to follow you, Lord? I want to be holy. I don't want this sin to be pervasive in my life anymore. And yet, it seems like the more I try not to do it, the more I do it. He's describing a spiral that really has two points. And this spiral goes round and round. First, I can't do the good I want to do. And the other side of the spiral is, I keep doing the bad I don't want to do. So I can't do the good, and I keep doing the bad. And brothers and sisters, I think it's helpful to know that when Paul wrote this, he's describing himself, I believe, as a Christian, that this is a Christian struggle. And when he wrote this, he had been a Christian for 25 years. So for those of us who think we're going to enter into perfection after 25 years of being a Christian, or that we should be, we need to look at Paul. Paul described his life that day, 25 years, as a Christian. So what does that tell you? The struggle is not going to end this side of heaven. The struggle will be with you. As a matter of fact, this struggle may increase in you with age. It may be more difficult to follow the things of God. The temptations may be greater with age as you become more cognizant of what his law actually is. It's harder because now you're more and more aware of how much you actually sin. If you really start drilling down on the issue of covetousness, if you really start drilling down, you might find that it is pervasive in your life. It is maybe why you go to work every day. And maybe once you retire, it may be the thing you get up looking on for new things, looking at everybody else's things, and I want those things, but I can't get them because I'm retired. So, so, right, it could increase over time. Now, in verse 14, we look at the first thing about this spiral. Verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am the flesh sold under sin. And this may be one of the most difficult things to square with the fact that I believe that Paul is a Christian. It tells us the law deals with the true spiritual me and reveals my true intentions and thoughts and actions. But then my sin kicks up because I am of the flesh. This means that though we are not living in the flesh, the flesh still lives in us. In other words, we're not living in sin, but sin is still in us. So we know that we're not mastered by sin as Christians, but it's still alive and active, and it tempts us. So then why does Paul say that we are sold under sin? This seems totally contrary to what Paul's been saying all this time. Hasn't Paul just told us earlier in chapter 6 that we were dead to sin? Romans 6, 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. So how can he then say, I'm sold under sin? Romans 6, 18, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So how could he say we are sold under sin? 
This, brothers and sisters, is the mystery of sanctification. That, that though something is true positionally, it is not always true practically. You have been fret, set free from sin positionally, but many of us live under the slavery of sin practically by choice. Though Paul is free from sin's mastery, it still works to get him to choose to obey. He gives in more often than he would like and thus feels like a slave. So he's saying he's, he's not a slave, but he feels like one in his daily life. You ever been there? And then in verses 15 through 20, notice the sway of the battle. He wants to do good. He even acknowledged that he is on the side of the law. Only those born again by the Holy Spirit can say that they're on the side of the law, by the way. This is why I think Paul was speaking of this as a believer. Psalm 119, 14, he says, In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. Psalm 119, 47, For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. This is, these are the words of a believer in God who has faith. Psalm 119, 77, Let your mercy come to me, that I might live, for your law is my delight. And Psalm 119, 141, and 142, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. These are the marks of a believer who, are, who is on the side of the law. He wants to do good. He wants to follow God's standards, but does not do what he wants because evil it keeps pulling him away from that. And so here we have sin is depicted here like a deceiving snake, tempting and drawing us away from doing what God wants. In verse 17, we see that it is not himself that is looking to sin, but sin living in him. This is vital. He says, so it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He's saying, I, in my person, in, in my inner self, who I really am, I don't want to sin. But there's this other th part of me that's dragging me into it every time. And so the dichotomy of our lives, the struggle of our lives inside of us needs to be understood as Christians. Because verse 17, he says, so now it is no longer I who do it. That phrase no longer in the Greek indicates a permanent change. In other words, he's been permanently changed by being born again. He no longer wants to sin. That's, that part of him is permanently changed. He always is fighting against sin, but his sin nature is now working against his new self. You see, you can only have a struggle like this if you're a Christian because you have a new self and an old self. And, and so it's the Christians who fight with these things. Now, Paul does not mean that he always sins or that his ratio of sinning is higher than his ratio of goodness. I, I'm sure that he's done a lot of righteous works, but he's just focusing on the aspects of his sin. So, so many of us may be sitting here thinking today, well, this is not me. I don't struggle this way because, you know, I do so many good things. And that may be true. So this is not a ratio thing of saying, you know, as long as, as, long as your sinning isn't out, outdoing your goodness, then you're good. It's saying, no matter how you look at it, if the goal is to have no sin in your life, even a little bit, 10%, is too much. And so he's saying, I don't want to do that, but I, I do do that. Failure is not what he wants. He wants success, and his true self wants to follow God with righteous intentions and holy results, but he's admitting here, he fails. He fails. And what he's telling us here is that he sabotages himself, and he is hopeless to help himself to stop sinning. Have you ever sabotaged yourself by sinning? Have you ever told yourself not to say something and you're going, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that, and then you just say it? And you kind of look at yourself and go, I'm sitting there telling myself not to say that to that person. And then, Bleh. it comes out. It's like I had to say it. But it really wasn't what you wanted. Is he not describing our lives every day? Have you ever told yourself not to look at an image or watch a show on TV and then you find yourself clicking it? Or uh, too much time, I spend too much time, and then two hours later, I told myself I spend too much time, why didn't I turn it off? Why did I allow myself to watch that image? Like, this is daily life. And so in verses 19 through 20, he repeats what he said in verses 15 through 17. The cycle of struggle is a daily battle. 
So there's two points of application we need to make with this. One is uh, the battle with sin, brothers and sisters, is not going to get easier. It will continue to increase potentially. Thus, we must be aware of sin's plan. We must be aware that this is a reality, that, that this is a struggle that will continue, and we need to dig in for the fight. We need, we need to, we need to uh, not give up and not stop struggling. Some people will look at this and go, and, and they did this long ago. They said, you know what? I've constantly struggled with sin, so I just give up. I'm just going to sin and not worry about what God thinks. Don't do that because of point three, which is coming. Don't get discouraged. Believe me, the battle you're in against your sin is bringing God glory. Point three will tell you this, but don't give up. We must also, hear, hear, me, hear me when I say this, we must also be patient with other Christians. We must realize that they are struggling inside. There's a battle going on, in, on inside of them. And oftentimes we look at people with black and white intentions. We say, you meant to say something mean to me. You meant to attack me. You meant to do this. But recognize that that person had a struggle going on when they said those things. When they did that thing to you, they struggled with it. They went home and they wrestled with it. And they're still wrestling with it. There's a battle going on inside of them. And so we should have grace with other people that when they're battling against sin, that we don't just see people as, as black and white, but, but we're, we're aware of the struggle that they have and we give them grace. This could help you in forgiveness. When somebody says, you know, when I said that really horrible thing to you, I asked for your forgiveness. And you recognize that part of them didn't really want to say that. And actually it's the true part of them. Doesn't that help with forgiveness? It really, really does. So we got to be gracious with one another in their struggle with sin. And lastly, actually I had three points. I said two. Forgot I had a third one. Remember this. Sin is in us, but we are not sin. Notice that Paul's saying here, verse 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. You, who you are as a person is not sin. Sin has infected you, and when you die, it will be gone, and you'll be you. So sin is your status of brokenness right now that will be fixed upon eternity. And so just remember that, that you fundamentally are not sin. You should not let sin identify you or your sins identify you because it's sin working against you that has led to so many things in life. Well, that leads us to our third and last point, and that is that my inner self struggles to see victory over my sin nature. So and I'm struggling because I want to see victory. I want, to, I want an end to this sin. I, I think many of us at this point are going, you know, Pastor Brett, are you making an excuse for sin where people can say, you know what? The sin nature made me do it where we have an out and we're not responsible. Remember, our sin nature is, is affected us, actually, and we actually did it. So we are still responsible for our sin. But we need to understand we are not sin. And we need to understand that, that this battle is going to end in victory, but not yet. Let's take a look at verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies right close at hand. So I want to do what's right, but evil is right there. And when he says there, a law, he doesn't mean the law, he means a law, you could put the word principle. So he's seeing that there's a principle that uh, when he wants to do right by the law, that evil is right there. Brothers and sisters, what he's saying is this. He's saying, it's not just me, it's everybody. It's a principle, it's a life principle that we're all struggling with sin. He's universalizing this truth. And in verse 22, he confesses that his true self loves the law. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. And, and all Christians do. So we need to universalize this. In who we are, we delight in the law. But then verse 23, But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So when he says that I see in my members, that's my body, another law waging war, a principle against the law of my mind, which is simply to say my inner self. He's not talking about um, just our... our um, 
mental capacity, because even our mental capacity is sinful. He's saying, the law of my mind, which is myself, making me captive to the law of sin. So there's, there's the law of my sin, myself, who doesn't want to do wrong, and then the law of sin is at work, dwelling in my members, making me do wrong things, and, and that's, this, that's the struggle that I'm in. So this attempt to follow God is proof positive that, that you are truly saved uh, in Christ. In other words, it's only Christians who, who struggle with these things, who love the law and, and fight against it, and who are, who are upset about it. So I just want to stop here and say this. Is this you? Do you love the law so much that you literally hate your sin? In other words, are you to a point where you are sick of your sin, or is it kind of okay? Because the mark of a true Christian is, is that we should be sick of our sin. This is not a status to avoid. This is a status to embrace. That we should be pretty disgusted with our own sin. That we should be to a point where we want to repent and we want it gone and we want to be different. And it's not just when we get caught. You see, it's an internal thing. A lot of people think that they, um, they're convicted by their sin because they got caught and they felt bad. That's not the mark of a Christian. Everybody does that. The mark of a Christian is, is that you have an internal struggle all the time with your personal sin to the point where people around you don't even know it. It's internal. It's, it's a fight because the Holy Spirit's in you and he's fighting for you and your sin nature is in you and fighting against you. That's the struggle of a Christian. I often have people come to me and say, Pastor Brett, I have enough sin in my life to where I wonder if I'm even saved. And I'm just consumed and broken by my own sin to the point I'm questioning my salvation. And I tell them this, the fact that you feel so wretched about your own sin is proof positive that you are saved. Because unbelievers don't get worried about such things. It, the struggle in you is the proof of the reality of the spirit in you, right? So, so we need to look at this struggle as a good thing. It's a proof that you're saved, and a proof that you want the things that God wants. And so we struggle with this. And then we get to verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He cries out and he said, I'm sick of my sin. I'm wretched. And who's going to deliver me from this body of death? He means his, his fleshly body. Because as long as we're in this fleshly body, we will have sin. And I just want to tell you that it's at that moment that you are truly becoming sanctified. It's this point that you all want to get to, that I want to get to. I want to say, wretched man that I am, all the time. Because if we say those things, here's the thing, brothers and sisters, then it's, it's, it's true that we are now walking by faith and we are experiencing the holiness of God. Every time in the Bible that someone experiences God and they are looking at him in the face, they say, wretched man that I am. Isaiah did this in Isaiah 6, 4 through 5. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called in his vision, and the house was filled with smoke. He's seeing God on his throne. And he says, woe is me, for I am lost I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Moses said this on the mountain, on, on Mount Sinai, when he experienced God. It says, then he said, uh, that is God, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. That's a good thing. That means he gets it. And then Peter with Jesus, after he had caught all of the fish at Jesus' command in Luke 5, 7, and 8 says, they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Have you ever wondered why he did that? Because he experienced the glory of God in Jesus Christ. He experienced the holiness of God, and he realized who he really was. And when we realize who we really are as sinful people in the face of a holy God, what will we do? We will no longer try to fix ourselves. 
we will say, who will rescue me from this body of death? And Jesus says, I will. Verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Your rescue is in Jesus Christ. And the only time that you're going to ask him for help is when you say, I'm a wretched person. You see what happens? This struggle leads us to Christ. It leads us to glory. It leads us to dependence on Jesus. When we get to the end of ourselves and say, Lord, I can't overcome this sin, Jesus says, that's exactly where I want you. Oh, that we would be so ready to be done with sin that our lives will be focused on the killing of it and on the Savior who will kill it for us. You know, when Paul says um, that he wishes to be delivered from this body of death, that word deliver is a Greek word that meant when a soldier would go chase after a fallen comrade in battle on the battlefield and drag him to the hospital. That's what that means. When you need to be delivered because you yourself are so wounded, you can't get up. And that's exactly what Jesus does. We are all wounded by sin, and we need our Savior's assistance. Where will our help come from? It comes from Christ. We should know that our earthly struggle, though not leading to ultimate victory over sin in this life, leads to another type of victory, which is dependence on Christ in this life, in the struggle. It seeks to lead to the victory of seeking sanctification from another source, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. And you know what? Paul's already told us this in verse 6. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not the old way of the written code. Brothers and sisters, this is the doctrine of sanctification. First, growing in godliness by the law is ineffective. Second, we must understand that the battle is inside of us and that it will keep on going until we die, so we must keep on our guard. And third, failure in the battle leads to dependence on Christ and ultimate victory in him. And I want to close with Galatians, who summarizes this whole passage so well. Galatians 5, 16 through 18, I pray that this would be a, an encouragement to you. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Do you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we praise you that you have so worked in us that we are not left to our own devices. That even when we get to a point where we admit how wretched we are and, and the, we are broken, that we can cry out to you and that you will rescue us. So Lord, I pray that we will practically apply this by saying this, every time I deal with sin, I must turn to Jesus. Every time I want to see a sin overcome in my life, I must turn to Jesus. Everything in my life that needs to go, I cannot do myself. I need Jesus. And so I pray, Lord, that as we do those things, that we would have the faith to know that we will become more like Christ as Christ works in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us as we recognize that he is our Savior. We find peace with him. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows 
is only you and you alone that is worthy to pay for all of this sin, Father. Thank you for giving your son as a sacrifice for us. The world is broken, and we have a Savior that saves, Lord. The shadows deepen, sin is there, but you have conquered, and you have brought the light. He is worthy.
Amen. Father, you are so worthy of all of our praise. Lord, thank you for um, reminding us this morning through your word that as we struggle, you have already won the victory. You have already won. And Father, as we battle through, help us remember that it is the Holy Spirit that, that frees, that comforts, guides, and it is the body of Christ, Lord, that lifts each other up. Uh, with that thought, Lord, I pray for the, the Herrera family as Grayson's getting ready to leave on six weeks of uh, basic training. Lord, just be with him as, he, as he, his goal is to become a chaplain. Lord, just bless his time. And Lord, just be with that family. And thank you, Father, for the family of Christ here this morning. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to send you out, but stick around for the business meeting. Um, then we'll have Sunday school right after that. We'll send you out with the chorus. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone 